also like to introduce the um, fourth and last speaker of this morning, um, Professor Fred Brooks from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, who won the Turing Award in 1999, and who will hopefully not be an illusion, but tell us about what makes illusions work and a way to evaluate uh, effective virtual environments. So now for something at the opposite end of rigor. Uh, I represent the engineering half of the computer science community and we'll be talking about something about as unrigorous as you can get. <clears throat> I want to talk then about four topics today. Sutherland's conjecture, the, uh, the vision originally stated. What do you mean work? What makes the illusion work? And some studies and results. I went to Chapel Hill in 1965 from IBM and decided that I wanted to do my, com my research work in the area of computer graphics. In December of that year, I went to the Fall Joint Computer Conference and Ivan Sutherland, who's sitting right here, gave a stunning speech that changed my intellectual life ever since. The key sentence is right here. Don't think of that thing as a screen. Think of that thing as a window. And through the window, one can look into a virtual world. And like Alice in Through the Looking Glass, one can go through that window into a virtual world and be completely immersed in a different world. So here was the challenge that Sutherland set forth in that speech, the complete, a complete challenge. First, one has a visual immersion in the virtual world. You don't see the real world at all by a head-mounted display or by being in a cave with a projected environment all around you. The viewpoint, as you move about, properly moves. So you are, you are seeing the virtual world in the same way that you see the real world. The task then is to improve image generation which was pretty primitive at the time, and to the point where the where real world, the virtual world, looks real. Moreover, improve the, the timing so that as you move about, the virtual world stays stationary like the real world does. And that turned out to be perhaps one of the hardest things accomplished over the 50 years. We'll come back to that. The user can directly manipulate things in the virtual world. And the whole question of how you do that is quite complicated. The manipulated objects obey realistic physics. Oh, we've got to reproduce physics in the virtual world. And the computer maintains the world model in real time. And finally, just for dressing, the real world has to sound real and feel real. So this has been the challenge that we've pursued. Now here's a picture of Ivan, somewhat younger. And in 1963, in his PhD dissertation, he invented essentially most of what we call interactive computer graphics. And so this two years later then, he comes with the components of an entirely larger vision. And then in the years later, he made contributions to making that visualization happen. So he built the first real virtual world system. Here's the tracker that was used in that system and the head-mounted display. The tracker is called the Sword of Damocles because over your head you really worried whether this thing is going to fall on you. And his students there at Harvard built one of the first virtual models of a real world object, measuring this VW thing and then constructing the geometric construct. So, what would this vision require to make it happen? Well, qu quite simply, a lot of things in the display, resolution, immersion, sound, should the sound be binaural or even 3D sound, and then in the 
there are many different haptic senses, that is, things we feel, and we have to reproduce all of those things to make this vision happen if the virtual world is to feel right. Then we have to model the virtual world, getting the geometry, the texture, the color, the physics of illumination, the optics, all right. And we would need to be able to put up something like 10,000 polygons per frame and 30 frames a second at least. Then we have to track, and this is the part that the entertainment industry has not solved for us make it possible to know where the eyes are so we can create an image that represents the possible thing. So we have to know where two eyes are. Moreover, we have to track the rest of the body. I want when I reach out my hand in the virtual world, I want my hand to be tracked. I want my feet to be tracked as I walked around. I want my, really, I want my, all the movable parts of my body and everything I can move in the virtual world to be tracked. And then there are a few little system questions. How do we get that fast update rate? How do we get that latency so that the virtual world doesn't swim as I move my head about? And how can I do this economically? So here, here are the components of Sutherland's challenge. And in fact, the last question is, if you can do all this, so what? Is there any real virtue in virtual reality? And that's a question I've spent a lot of energy on in the last 50 years. But the whole field has, has been for 50 years pursuing Sutherland's vision and trying to address the components of Sutherland's challenge. Now, question is, second part, what makes the illusion work? And the first question this raises is, what do you mean by work? And so we have to arrive at a definition of what is success in the virtual world. And the definition I have chosen is to say that an effective virtual environment is one that causes the user to behave as if they were in the real world. So there's a definition. Now, how do you measure it? We're scientists. We want to be able to say this system is more or less effective than that. And many methods have been used. The gold standard method for the applications I've been studying is training transfer. If I train people in a virtual world, will they then, when exposed to the same conditions in the real world, behave the way that I trained them in the virtual world? Now, training transfers experiments are very expensive and very difficult. It's hard to get hold of the subjects and put them through first the training and then the testing. So we've done very few of those and the whole field has done very few of those. Now what we began as a field with subjective questionnaires in which you give people the experience of the virtual world and then you ask them after the experience, why well, did you feel present? And we quantitated that into Likert, seven-point Likert scales and sub-questions and all the details of that. But so for many years, subjective questionnaires after the experience were the only test we had of effectiveness. Another method that was used is to say, well, talk about it as you go. So while you're in the experience, talk about the experience with a report of how it's feeling to you. Well, the trouble is, if you're talking about it and you're thinking about it, are you really doing the experience? Are you, are you spending your energy and your mental effort on how you're going to report it? And so there's a, there are problems there. Then there are behavioral measures, and I'll show you an example of one of those in a minute, in which we can measure the behavior without necessarily telling the subject uh, that what, what we're measuring. And finally, I'll talk about measuring physiological surrogates for presence. They're not presence, but they are, we believe they are highly correlated with presence. Now, <clears throat> what psychologists do when they do experiments of the sort we do, uh, they are trying to learn something about the human mind. We are engineers and we are trying to 
learn enough about the human mind to make effective systems. So it's really engineering psychology, not scientific psychology, that we're doing these crude experiments. We didn't know how to do these crude experiments, and so we've always insisted on, on our PhD committees, including a, a shown enough real psychologist to, to help keep us honest in the methods that we were using. So here's a behavioral experiment of the sort we did. At the far right end, there's a machine gun, virtual machine gun, and here are barriers, and the task is to go between the barriers here. In the, in, in the virtual world, you're doing this with a head-mounted display. The barriers are virtual, and the machine gun is virtual. At times, there come bursts of fire. They are, in fact, predictably spaced, and so you, you run from one barrier to the next during the gaps in the machine fire. Now, we set up real styrofoam barriers here and, and have not a real machine gun, but at least the real sounds, and we have people actually running, just as they were in the virtual world, actually running among the barriers. Now we can measure training transfer, but what is the behavioral measure? An answer, how many bullet holes you have in you? So we have a quantitative measure uh, in the virtual world, and we have a quantitative measure in the real world, and this then is a legitimate training transfer experiment, even though a very primitive one. So, I've said that. Now, we decided we wanted a better measure, and I'll talk a minute about what by, we mean by a better measure, and we said, let's take the low-hanging fruit, the easiest thing to do, and that is create a low-stress environment, create a high-stress environment, have an unexpected transfer from the low-stress environment to the high-stress environment, and measure what happens to the physiological characteristics of the subject as they change from low stress to high stress. Now, as I say, this is not presence, but we believe this is a reasonable surrogate for presence, and it has several advantages as a measure. So here's our experimental environment. We have a, and this was invented by Mel Slater, then at University of London, now Barcelona, the m most outstanding scholar in the field of virtual reality and much the best experimentalist. So, on the left, we have a, a living room set up, and there, this model is not as accurate as the one we actually used. We had pictures, and we had some furniture, and there were bean bags, and there were circular targets on the floor, and the experimental participants would be advised by a standard protocol over earphones to walk over to the bookcase and pick up a bean bag and walk across the room and drop it on the target on the floor and so that we have a target and you do this with two or, two or three different bean bags and then the instructions are when, when you pick up the red bean bag the door behind you will open up go through it and drop the bean bag on the target on the floor well the target on the floor is on this floor let me go back and as you go as you go through the door you're standing on this diving board 18 feet above that floor and the target is located down there such that you have to go all the way to the end of the diving board to see it and lean over if you're going to try to hit the bullseye you have to lean over very carefully guess what that increases stress uh, there's a surprise element when you see it as you go through the door the instructions insist that you walk to the end and the task that you have of dropping the bean bag on the target mandates that you walk to the end because you can't see the target clearly until you get to the edge. It's very realistic. Furthermore, in my experience, and I must have done this 40 times, you don't get used to it. The experience is very real. Now, in fact, we had a platform go all the way around and we told people they could walk around to the edge and we've had people walk around to the other edge and sometimes people say, can I walk across? Well, 
The answer is, in fact, you can. We don't simulate your falling. So it's as if the floor is glass. And about one person out of 10 is willing to walk across. And about one person out of 10, between one out of 10, one out of eight, are unwilling to go out on that diving board, whatever at all. The experiment is over when they go through it. And we've had university presidents who fell into that category. I mean, it's, it is not correlated with anything as far as I can tell. So this is a camera view, and uh, we, this is the user view as you are standing on the diving board looking off the end. And here's a person rigged up with our physiological measuring apparatus. We, if we had enough money, all this would be radio connected and not wire connected, but we never quite had that much money. Now, the question is, what stress response shall we measure? So we went through a series of experiments in trying to determine what would work. The first thing we tried was breathing rate, and the response is much too slow. Then we tried the galvanic skin response, that is, how much do your palms sweat when you're scared? And it turns out that because our people were moving, the accelerating forces changed the contact pressures with the palm sweat and messed up that experiment although I think some other people have done that more successfully than we did. And then we did measured heart rate, but some people's heart rates are pretty slow and some people's heart rates are pretty fast and the variance across subjects was way too wide for that to be useful. But we discovered that measuring just the change in heart rate between the low stress room and the high stress room had, a, had an acceptably low variance and we could get statistically significant experiment experimental data this way. So we are, as I say, this is not presence, but we believe this is a reasonable surrogate for presence in this optimal environment. I mean, this is really the low-hanging fruit. This, if, if anything is going to work, this would work because of the, strange, the strange changes in stress are substantial. Now, what is a good measure? What, what is the definition of a good measure? for something as hard to even think about as presence or even these physiological surrogates for presence. Well, first thing, you want it to be objective. And this is a big advantage over questionnaires because the questionnaires are subject to the different, the participant having bias and different participants deciding, yes, I think I feel presence in the next participant under subject to exactly the same environment says, no, I don't feel present. There's also subject to experimental bias because you word the questions in the questionnaire in such a way as to elicit the response that you want. So this has the tremendous advantage of being really objective. It, we had to do tests to determine whether it was sensitive and we had to do correlations with our previous measures to see if it correlated the, the same kind of answers the best that we could get out of questionnaires and out of the behavioral measures, which include video questions. You video people's behavior. You, have, you analyze the video. You have two or three analysts analyze the same video and see the degree to which they agree and so forth. And the, experiment, the measure needs to be reliable. That is, if I put the same subject through the same measure, I should get the same result over and over. Well, of course you don't because, in fact, there's a somewhat of a decline in response with re repeated exposures to this stress, but it never goes away. And ideally, the measure should be contemporaneous. That is, we should be getting a measure all through the experiment as it happens rather than a post-experiment sort of measure. And this one then we spent some energy and some PhD dissertations trying to do studies to establish that it was valid, that it was liable, that it was sensitive. And we did uh, some, other, some other studies of change with frame rate, multiple exposures. How, how much do people vary the second, the third, the fourth time of experiment? So here are some of our studies and some of the results that we've gotten, and I'll be happy to talk with people later. I'm going to summarize a lot of results. Our best methodology, then, of how to me make measure an effective system is to make the most effective system we can 
and then back off on one parameter at a time and try to see if we get a measurable difference. So that then we're measuring the change in effectiveness. And here's an example of a, an absolutely incomprehensible result. We changed frame rate from, we made a 30, 30 frame a second frame rate, and then we backed it off to 20 and to 15 and to 10. And look at what happens. Sure enough, it backs off like it ought to, down to 15. And then at 10, we get a, a better result than we got at 15. Do you understand that? No, I don't, I don't understand that. None of our folks understand that. But we've got a measure, and we've got a way of finding then unexpected phenomena. And this is a good example of an unexpected phenomenon. Another question we wanted to ask is, all right, can we make the real world feel real? And can we measure the degree to which we get a difference in response by changing how it feels? So in our early experiments, we painted the pattern on the floor, and it looked like a diving board, and it looked like an abyss where the, where the carpet is there. Um, and we measured how people responded. Then we said, okay, let's put a wooden, a, a real shown off wooden piece there so that when you got to the edge, your foot dangled off. Well, we used three quarter inch plywood and sure enough, you got to the edge, but your foot touched the carpet. Okay, raise it to an inch and a half your foot still touched the carpet. Raise it to two and a quarter. Oh, now nobody's foot touched. And our stress response then was substantial. Moreover, we got significantly different results between the case in which we only had a visual cliff and the case in which we had a visual cliff plus a haptic cliff that you felt with your foot. And the difference was about 20 heartbeats per minute uh, from about 80 to about 100, which proved to be statistically significant with a relatively modest experimental subject pool. Then we said, okay, we can, let's, let's build something more elaborate and see if we can uh, do more elaborate something than just your foot on the floor. So we made them physical model of a kitchen and we may and here's the physical model made of styrofoam and just press board and we had a virtual model of the kitchen up there in the top and so what the user experienced is what you see in the lower right hand corner moreover as you walk through it you could reach out and touch the cabinet and we said okay now can we devise a task in which we can do a metric and the answer was no this was too complicated so if you go to some of the most modern commercial systems they'll have you try to make a sandwich but it's pretty awkward it, the, 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 it's way too complicated so we dropped back and we said okay we're not going to try to do a measure with a system this complicated but we'll do a train and transfer measure and built a real styrofoam maze and had people practice learning the maze in the virtual world and then learning the maze where they could feel it as they were. They were they've got a blindfold. That is, they can't see the real maze. They've got a head-mounted display on, essentially, and they're seeing the virtual maze, but they can feel it as they go. And we got statistically significant results. Yes, if you learn it, and then we blindfolded people and had them walk the maze as the, as the, the measure test, the difference between the, how well they, to see how well they were able to do. And it turns out the people who were trained being able to touch the real and see the virtual did statistically significantly better than the ones who were only able to see the virtual even though they were walking around 
in, in, the, in the same maze. Moreover, the people who trained principally virtual had a much higher rate of taking the same wrong turn over participant and participant and participant. And the people who were trained having the haptics in addition to the visual, the virtual, the visual virtual world didn't make that mistake. Uh, it, they, it was pretty clean result. We were very pleased with that one. <clears throat> so this was the virtual training environment and the, the green one is the one where people were taking the wrong turn as they came around. Here's another one we did in which we had a different environment and we were doing train and transfer st studies on this one in which the task is somewhat different. This is kind of like a model kitchen. It, it's not really, but... Now, another experiment we did was to try to measure w could we get a difference between 2D sound in which you just have directional sense and 3D sound in which you can locate an object above or below. There has been a fair amount of research done in that area already, but in all the previous research, the subjects had their chins clamped to a chin rest, and the sound was then moved about, and the research done uh, by Elizabeth Wexler, I believe her name, uh, showed that in fact people could tell that where 3D objects were. So we said, okay, let's try doing that in which the subjects are not positioned, but instead we'll have a room and, we, and we'll have a sound source that's located somewhere between your knees and your, and your reach here and somewhere in the room. And we played a tremendously annoying little tune that, and you, you come in the corner of the room and the task is walk over to where the sound is and put your finger on where the sound source is coming from. And then we will give you on the earphones either the 2D sound or the 3D sound and see if we can measure the difference in your performance. And we said if you're within, I think, 10 centimeters of the actual point source, that's a successful, successful hit. Well, it turned out we couldn't get any difference between the 2D sound and the 3D sound. And so we asked the question, why, why is that? How can that be? The answer is, if we look back over the videos of people doing this, what they would do is this. It turns out that your sensitivity in this direction is, you know, maybe two or three orders of magnitude higher than the one that depends on the shape of your outer ears. The, w the one that depends upon both volume difference and phase difference of the sound is very sensitive, and the one that depends upon the modulation of the response by the shape of the ear is not very sensitive. And so everybody was harnessing the, power, the sensitive one to determine the height and not using the other information at all. So that was one that it started out as a disappointment, but ended up as a, an insight that why should we spend $40,000 on a 3D sound generator instead of just staying with the 2D sound, which is much easier to synthesize. One of the problems we face is we, we wanted it to have people really walk around in the virtual world because an earlier experiment that we had done with Mel Slater's team in London jointly showed that real walking, well, what we showed precisely was that staying still compared to flying with a joystick, you're better off flying with a joystick. You will feel more present than you are staying still. Moreover, really walking, you feel more present than you are if flying with a joystick. And we measured in between. Suppose you, it turns out that if you're walking in place, that that's better than flying. That just, just the physical motion of your legs makes you feel more present, more like you're moving through the environment 
than pushing the joystick. So we said, okay, we, we built a tracking system that was locally invented by Henry Fuchs, and we have a kind of 30 by 40 foot tracked area, and it uses celestial navigation. There are little infrared lights all over the ceiling, and uh, the, the hard thing in celestial navigation is knowing which star you're looking at, and in our system, the stars turn on one at a time, and that makes it much easier to tell which one you're looking at. And so we have a little golf ball-sized thing with six cameras in it, uh, lateral effect diodes that measure the X, Y position, and we sight the stars. And e each cycle, it, uh, we light the stars right around where the last time was, and so most of the, and then use a Kalman filter to predict where you're going to be next time. <coughs> And with that, we can get 1,500 updates a second of, uh, on position, and we use that for hand tracking and another one for, for head tracking. So the, now the question is, you would like to be able to walk in a big space, but we don't have a big space. We, and our original space was this little one that you see in the red thing here. And so our PhD student, Sharif Razak, said, Maybe we can fool people into thinking that they are walking in a big space when they aren't. So he set up an experiment in which you have this large space shown on the lower left, and your task is to come in the door. As a fire alarm goes off, you have to run, shut the window. Well, you have to first run, hit the, there's a fire. You run, hit the fire alarm. You run across the room and shut the window you run across the room and turn on the halon, and then you get out the door in the diagonal corner. And it turns out that once people are turning their head anyway at this jig jags, you can fool them any amount as to how much they are turning. The inner ear is utterly confused because it's turned off essentially during that, that turning response. And so, if this is in the upper right-hand corner, we see the path in the virtual world that people were really walking. And in the lower right-hand corner, we see the path that they actually walk in our track space without realizing that they had turned at all. Now, our task was designed to make them turn. And so the next set of experiments were done. Can we get them to turn in a more general way? And so the, the PhD student who did that task had a butterfly up here, and you turned your head to look at the butterfly, and guess what? As long as you turn your head, we've got you fooled. We did an experiment in Slater's Cave in London in which we turned the environment around, and I, I can't find the video of that. That was some years ago. And as the person, this person, this person is walking in place, but as they turn, we move the environment imperceptibly around, and they think they're walking in a much larger auditorium even than the, uh, than the space in the cave, and they don't notice that it's moving. The task in a cave is to keep them from turning around into the open wall that they came in through. And so we are able to keep them faced forward in, in, through the experience without realizing that they are being surreptitiously turned in, in their direction. And it's really kind of comical looking at that video. The, the person is turning here, and they start to go off in a different direction, and then they, without, without realizing anything's happened, they just turn back around in, in the same direction again. Then the biggest study we did, we did at SIGGRAPH, where we set up a demonstration of our whole pit system with the physiological measuring. We had a pipeline, so we had seven stages of getting people into the apparatus, getting, going through the experience, getting them out of the apparatus, getting their subjective questionnaires at the end, and the whole thing. We demonstrated this to 192 people over three days, which was an accomplishment. The whole team, uh, we, we set up our track ceiling, and it, it was a, a big deal. And we got 66 usable sets of data from this. The question we were investigating 
had to do with latency. At that time, some of the virtual reality systems that people had built had latencies as bad as 250 milliseconds, and, and they swim. So we have a sign up in our laboratory, that, a no swimming sign, and that's been a, a goal th through the years was no, no swimming in the virtual laboratory. But people generally thought, and we did, that if you got down below 100 milliseconds, that people wouldn't notice the difference. And so we decided we would test that hypothesis at the SIGGRAPH experiment. Now, at SIGGRAPH, you have to kind of relax your participant uh, requirements, and so we did not insist that you have a good night's sleep before, nor that you be stone cold sober. But, uh, and that's why we got only 66 sets of, of uh, <laughs> good data from some almost 200 participants. And then we measured half the people at 90 millisecond latencies and half the people at 50, which was the best we could get at the time. We, we've since gotten it down nearer 20, but uh, that takes a lot of work. And we were not there then. And contrary to what we had thought before, the 50 millisecond ones were, did significantly better on the heart rate measure than, now of course with a little subject pool this large, it's easier to get significance <coughs> than the 90 second ones, but it was quite a striking, quite a striking effect. Another study was if you see your real hand in the virtual world, instead of a model of your hand, does that help you in task performance? And so we did an informal study here. We did a formal study. So we, uh, using cameras, maintained a visual whole model of the real hand. And then this, this is a, you can see the real hand here, uh, there, and the model hand here and a model dish that you're washing under a model faucet. Insert the models into the virtual environment. The, usual f the user then feels the real thing and he sees the virtual thing and the model of the hand. We tested this informally with an interesting task with some NASA engineers who were designing instrumentation to go in an unmanned flight. And the task is that they have to not touch anything except exactly what they're doing because it contaminates and they have to then re-sterilize everything that's going to go in, into the space environment. And so the task they had was a, a, originally a, a, a piece of pipe to insert some wires into without touching the edge of the pipe. And we went through that with both the in which they could actually see their real hand or versus see their model hand. And sure enough, seeing their real hand, they perform better. We did not get measurements on that one, but we did show that it, we showed in a controlled experiment with uh, the usual college sophomores that uh, we got an improved performance with quantitative measure, and we showed in the informal experiment with real engineers that it, they were, the virtual, all the rest of the instrumentation that they were not to touch was all entirely virtual, but the pipe that they had to put the wires in and the wires were, were real. And so their, their report was that they were more able to put the wires, the real engineers from NASA, uh, Goddard, reported that they were better able to perform, but we didn't get numerical measurements on that. Now, the most stunning study and the most surprising had to do with illumination. There are many different ways to approximate illumination in a virtual world. And the simplest way, and you've seen the cartoony pictures that look like Saturday morning TV, in, in, in which every polygon is just plain flat shaded. And then there are more complicated ways in, in which you get it more and more realistic. And so we said, all right, let's measure the degree to which the changes in realism of the illumination improve the, our measure of presence by physiological measures. And we degraded the illumination. We started with really good, not ray traced, but, all, but all, next best thing. 
illumination and then we degraded it and it didn't change the effect and so the worst case is this one we went all the way to the point where we took all the color out we took all the shading out we just put this grid in but guess what your kinetic depth effect of these grid lines moving relative to each other as you walk out on that diving board is still substantial enough to make your heart rate jump by an amount indistinguishable from what happened with the very best illumination we could get. We were utterly surprised at that, and Slater in Barcelona has done some subsequent experiments that, uh, that don't agree with, with our results, so, but his metric was not the same as ours, and we don't exactly understand what the differences are. So, summary of some results. Walking in place is better than flying, and walking is better than that. We had a head-mounted display that had 12 tiles in it, 6 by 2, and we were able then to measure field of view effects. And the answer that we got was 112 degrees is significantly better than 48 degrees field of view, and 176 is significantly better than 120. Now, your own field of view is more than 180. So you can, in fact, see behind your head a little bit. And, and the, the best wide-angle head-mounted displays are beginning to get to, to 180 today. This experiment was done some time ago. I've talked about the next two. Uh, the dynamic real object, the dishwashing, imperceptible direction on real walking, latency, and the light approximations, and the 3D sound not really being measurably better than the 2D sound because people harness the 2D, 2D sound to do the 3D task. So those are summaries of our results. Now, where is the field now and where is it going? Quick summary. Everybody feels present and nobody is fooled very long. Uh, we've shown that the perception aids the mental formation of 3D models. Our transfer study showed that. We showed that personal control of objects improves performance learning. The hand that rocks the cradle feels sig gets a significantly more realistic feeling than an observer at the same time observing the same effect. And so the actual participation and we did an, a, a study in which we used a six degree of freedom remote manipulator to dock drugs in a protein. We had 12 um, biochemistry students trying to dock drugs and we had, um, I think eight, we had 12 proteins, we had 20 some students. And six of them were ones in which the docking of the drug in the protein was known and six of them were ones in which the docking position of the drug in the protein is not known. And then we, our manipulator had six degrees of force feedback. It was a ceiling mounted gadget we got from Argonne Laboratories. It was originally used as a master slave system for doing chemistry with barrels of radioactive stuff on the, on the slaves, and the slaves had gotten uh, radioactive and had to be buried and our gun gave us the uh, masters and we hooked two of them up to make a, a remote manipulation system and then did the measurement and then we had this one doing the a virtual manipulation that you're seeing in the screen. Now that was to not totally immersive, it was a big screen and you saw the protein on the screen, you saw the drug, on the protein on the screen and you saw the drug and could manipulate the drug and then we either turn the motors off for some of the subjects and turn the motors on for other of the subjects. And yes, indeed, I was hopeful that being able to feel this docking task where you have a electrostatic and a, a thermodynamic and other forces at work in trying to find wh where this odd-shaped object, which is deformable, the drug, fits into the hollow of the protein, which is typically not, not readily deformable. The hydrogens move a little bit, but not enough for you to feel the difference. And I was hopeful we would get a big factor by being able to feel it, and we didn't. We got a factor of two. I had been hoping for 10. But we got a factor of two in, in performance improvement and how well people were able to, to fit the 
drug into the molecule. Now, today, in the world, this addresses the question of if you can do it, so what? There are many real production applications, especially in the fields of design and in the fields of training, military training, high-cost high training. Any training in which you'll pay in the person being trained is high-cost training. Uh, public education is not. You're not paying the students, and so the costs are prohibitive for public education. It's being used for geologic data, for plan planning horizontal oil well drilling under the sea, for example. It's being used in engineering design of cars, airplanes, and NASA training, very elaborate NASA training complete with the force feedback effects. The one that pleases me most is one we did at Chapel Hill. We were collaborating with a professor of physical therapy who was, had a, has a dual belt treadmill with force plates under it that measure the forces and the torques on the feet. And he was concerned with rehabilitating paralysis patients, teaching them to walk again. And typically they can, they're para paralyzed on one side and, and not on the other. And so they, they walk crooked and they have to learn to walk straight. Well, this was installed in a concrete block basement, and that's pretty dull doing hour by hour, week after week. So we built them a virtual environment here in which they have a, originally a yellow brick road to try to walk on, and that turned out to be too hard. They couldn't do it, and they got discouraged with the real patients. And so instead, we've substituted one in which you have a, a woods over here, and the word is strike out for the trees on yonder hill, and do the best you can. And, and it turned out that it imp he, he had intricate measuring equipment of what they were doing, and it turned out that they improved. They are able, encouraged to try to do that, and they get better at doing it. And the most encouraging thing about this is that the wife of our department's associate chairman had a stroke and was paralyzed, and she was treated on this two years after we had, had built it. And so we really got feedback that touch the heart as well as the head. Now, what are the open technical questions? Where do we go from here? The, the real thing is really hard interaction. How do you do this feeling of virtual objects for the more general case than our very limited ones? How do you do the manipulation when you don't really put your hand into the virtual world? Or if you put your hand in, how do you track, for example, fingers? Uh, that's a, that's a ta hard tracking task. How do you do locomotion? Can you really build a big ceiling track space for every training task? No, you can't. You have to train Marines on the troop ship on the way over the ocean and then very much room. Uh, and how do you do wayfinding in a complex environment? So all of us have been lost in hospitals and big shopping centers, well, it's much easier to get lost in a virtual one than it is in a real one. And I, I don't fully understand why, and neither do our psychologists, but the question of how you give the cues that help people find their ways. So we're no longer, I'm, I'm retired, and my, this, my team partner, Mary Whitten, Experimental computer science is a team sport, not, not a solo sport, unlike theoretical computer science. And so we are, we're kind of out of business at this point. But we had developed a vision and we made a proposal to the National Science Foundation for how to tackle the next big challenge. So I began with a challenge and I'll end with a challenge for the young researchers. How do you four person EMT team or military team. Okay, we came up with a proposal that covered all the components. It would have taken a 10-year exercise and $10 million. We didn't get the money, but we got to the finals of the four. See, touch, talk to each other. Everybody tracked. Individual stereo views of the virtual environment for all four people. No encumbrance beyond just glasses that are doing the display. Real instruments intermixed with virtual and generate stress that you can measure. 
So here's the vision of our scenario. Here's the patient here. Here are the workers. Here's a, the ambulance and so forth. And we envisioned it in this kind of space. So you can see the real tool for the heart, the real patient, and the real workers loafing here in this picture. And the, real, the ambulance, you can feel it, all right? You can't see it there. And then here's how it would appear to the participants. So there's the challenge. All you have to do is realize that over the next few years. So what does this require? Well, much the same things as Ivan's vision required 50 years ago that we've been chasing ever since. Now, it is a team sport, and here are our PhD graduates, and lots of MS students have been participants here. Here are our collaborators in London, Barcelona, and Chapel Hill. And here's where the money has come from, and it's taken a lot of money, and we're thankful for that. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much for your very enjoyable and inspiring talk. I already see questions there. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Dixelary. Um I was wondering that a lot of these experiments are similar to the ones psychologists do. Yes. And do you, so do you work with psychologists? Yes, we always have a psychologist on every PhD committee to keep us honest. <laughs> we don't have always have a perceptual psychologist, which is what we wish we had, but our department is not rich in perceptual psychologists, and so we've worked with some from other institutions. Yeah. And also, a lot of the psycho psychological experiments are done with animals, um, you know, like rats do... We know, have not yeah. tried doing virtual reality for animals. Okay. All right. Thanks. It's hard enough with people. So there's one question there. I better, there's a microphone. Am I on? On the left. Yeah. Um, yes. Hi. Two of us. Um, should I ask my question? Yes, please. Um, so, uh, I'm not into computer science at all, so this question might be a bit naive and beyond the realm of uh, what you do, but uh, the experiment that you showed in your slides uh, really reminded me of these movies, the Matrix Trilogy and uh, Inception, and what they do is the people zone out and uh, find themselves in a world which is completely real. So they, they not only see virtual, they also feel virtual. So you don't have to put any sensors. What they do is a sensor in the brain. So I understand that this also goes into the realm of neurosciences, but do you see things of that sort happening in the, let's say, next 50 years? Because that would be fascinating because, I mean, you could learn things in going into that world while you're asleep. So for the lazy people like me. <laughs> uh, I invite my computer science colleagues among the young researchers to take that challenge on. Uh, I'm a very poor predictor. I'm not good for 10 years, much less 50. And so I can't tell you where it's going to go. I can tell you that it is what we have demonstrated it is really useful for training applications. And, and if we hadn't demonstrated it, the flight simulator people have. They actually have uh, pilots fly passengers the first time they have flown a new model if they have trained in the simulator for that model. And that has taken them many years to arrive at. And that is a mixed reality application in which Everything in the cabin you feel, and the force, the force de demonstrates a very realistic. I flew a 707 simulator, a $13 million VR instrument, around London for two hours uh, and landed in Hong Kong and taxied up to a plane in Beijing. And I was worried that my wing was going to clip his as I taxied up to the hangar. And I looked back along my wing, and it was gray and I had been flying. It was just a blank screen. It wasn't there. There was no way. And it was an, it was an emotional jolt. I had been flying. The, the simulator was very good. You could even, when you were taxiing, feel the tar strips that separated the concrete segments from each other bump. And as you were flying, you could feel the wind forces. I had learned to fly in a little light plane, and a 707 has quite different dynamics, so I was hunting through the air like a porpoise would have kind of a 400-foot amplitude, and I was really stressed trying to keep that plane level. But the simulation was, 
was extremely accurate and very convincing so that I had been fooled. I say you, most people are sooner or later they're not fooled. Well, I was not fooled when I looked along that wing, but for most of that first hour and a half before that experience, I had been really fooled. And at that time, the fact that I got this sensational jolt when the illusion was broken said I had been really fooled. So. That was the perfect question as preamble to what I have to ask. Uh, I'm over here. Um, you pointed out uh, you had, a, you had a, a critical question to ask, is there any virtue in virtual reality? And you pointed out also that Ivan Sutherland over here, had said that uh, you don't think of it as a screen, but think of it as a cave. So I immediately said, to myself, that's a perfect question for Plato. And uh, as you know, Plato, yes. Plato was urging us, the philosopher, he wanted to free the philosopher from the, uh, the cave and the illusion. So my question is, uh, do you think this may set back philosophy by 2,500 years to have this amazing success in virtual reality? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> do you see any downside to this, uh, this kind of... Uh, not, not to philosophy. Hi. Hi. Uh, so you talked a lot about making the experience more immersive, which is really interesting. I was wondering from uh, you know, a hardware or a technical perspective, if you have any thoughts about how we can, can help with that. Do we need better algorithms? Do we need faster, lower energy hardware or the, something the, else? The processes have come along, and particularly the graphics cards, the game cards of today have, which are the, have been financed by the entertainment industry, have radically changed our processor task. And so now the processing is not really part of the problem. The hard, and the displays have gotten better due to first television and then many other things, and frame buffers. So the hardest part today and the part that is peculiar to our systems is the tracking and there is no big economic force developed in tracking. There is in the virtual community various things happening in tracking and improving full body tracking, but they are not cheap. And the ones that are precise are not cheap and the ones that are cheap are not precise. So tracking is the area where we most seriously need hardware development and tracking of a lots of things at the same time. So I said in the, in the training vision, eight, eight eyes plus eight hands plus eight feet plus the tools all got to be tracked at the same time at a rate on the order of a several hundred times a minute, several hundred times a second, I'm sorry. Yeah, now that, that's a real challenge is how to do tracking most effectively, multi-point tracking, how to distinguish which point you're seeing, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole question of how do I display eight scenes to four people in a room, the answer, our, our answer was time division multiplexing, and that seemed to be the only way we could see to, to, to generate and display eight different scenes to eight different eyes at the same time. All right. So that, 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 that's, a, that's a hardware task that nobody has done, but that one's doable, but the tracking is still more serious. Okay. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Uh, I can say there are many applications about this research, uh, such as um, movie making for in entertainment, uh, but I will also know it always uh, takes much effort and money to do this. Um, so I'm uh, curious about what kind of, uh, what part of work do you think is the most challenging to make it more economical to be applied in different uh, applications. Well, model building Thank you. people are beginning to successfully do with cameras. And they are combining camera visualization with inertial to, to do tracking, head tracking better, because the inertial will give you very high update rates, thousand times a second. And the visual is much slower, but on the other hand, the, the inertial tracking has a drift, drift in it. 
and the visual corrects the drift. And so if you can correct the drift, you know, one time a second and update a thousand times a second inertially, that, that, that's a good tracking technique. Now, can that be developed in, into multipoint tracking is a harder, harder question. Um, I haven't spent any energy on entertainment. A lot of people have, and I've wanted to spend my energy elsewhere. So I've been most concerned with the design applications and the training applications. And I think in terms of real benefit to society, that's probably where the, the, the most fruit is, is design applications and, and training applications. And there's one last question in the back. Um, Hello, Dr. Brooks. This is Edmund Begoli from Oak Ridge National Lab. And first, I want to attest to the usefulness of virtual reality of the work you have done, because we at National Lab actually do work on the nuclear reactors and design by using actually uh, uh, virtual representation of advanced designs. But what I want to ask you is about the challenges to the virtual reality adoption. And that is, uh, first, problems with emotion sickness in a, in a moving environment, and two, the factor of, uh, how is it called, um, uncanniness or rejection to the virtual characters that humans experience because of their creepy appearance. So these are the things that I have seen that have been historical obstacles to the adoption. Well, I think the representation of, of human characters, clearly, if you, if you just look at the work in the film industry where they are willing to spend a thousand hours of computer time to generate a realistic human model, it gets better and better and better. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to, to let the, uh, the, there have always been two branches of interactive computer graphics. Make it look good no matter how long it takes and make it work fast no matter how bad it looks. And they've grown together uh, over the decades to really, you get a whole lot of both at the same time now. <clears throat> so. The, the uncanny valley effect, as you're talking about, where as you get more and more realistic, suddenly you get to a point where that it, it doesn't look realistic at all. And we don't fully understand that psychologically. But the motion sickness is, is a real problem, and it depends on latency more than any other one factor. And uh, my, my colleague, Mary Whitten, my co-author on this talk, uh, is a canary, and we've used her. She, she gets motion sick very easily in a virtual environment. We can use that to test how well we're doing. Um, my good wife, Nancy, went into our model of a virtual kitchen that we were, and uh, a little way in, our latency was not so good, and she, the, her response was, get me out of this thing. On, on the other hand, just that experience changed the design of the kitchen because we discovered that one thing we had designed was really going to be bad. And uh, so doing, doing the work of modeling the kitchen proved to be, and it's a lot of work to make a realistic model of a, of a proposed design, proved, proved to be worth all the work. Yeah. So but thanks. getting the latencies down is the solution to motion sickness, I think. So thank you very much for your talk and for answering all the questions. And I just want to remind you that today we have a longer lunch break until 3 to give you also the occasion to look at the Azusa exhibition. And at 3 we start with the Hot Topic session, which is, I think, promising to be very exciting this afternoon.